Have you heard about the Asbury Revival? Was it a real Holy Ghost heaven sent revival? Was it a national revival? Was it a personal revival? Did it just happen among the college students and others? Tell me what you think. Please leave your comments. And my intention of this study tonight is not to say yay or nay about this movement of God. Instead, I want to describe the subject of revival. And certainly, I'm encouraged by whatever the Lord did in this movement of God. I have heard that uh, one of the professors or the president has curtailed the services. And so, nonetheless, we rejoice in what the Lord has done. And I want to ask you this. Are you a candidate for revival? Let's talk about this subject. Interesting to note, I met a young man just a few years ago, probably five years ago, when we were going to the assisted living in Social Circle, Georgia. His name is Jim Medlock. Jim recently came to the church, New Rocky Creek, and asked me if I would write a letter of recommendation for him to go to Asbury College University. That was prior to this revival or this spiritual awakening that has recently taken place. So he'll be going to this university. Now, the subject is revival, the Asbury revival. And when we talk about revival, we're talking about revival, technically speaking, is meant for believers, Christians. It's bringing them back to life, restoring life in something that's about to die. It's not for lost people. Uh, revival, once God brings revival to his people, then the result is lost or unbelievers will come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I saw that firsthand when the privilege of going to a place in the Philippines and preaching in the mountain areas and the people have been praying and fasting and crying out to God for a Holy Ghost spiritual awakening. The Lord began to do that and People were getting right with the Lord, Christians were, and the end result was lost people, unbelievers in the community could see there was a difference that Jesus Christ made in their life, and they wanted to be a part of it. They came one by one and were saved during that revival, had the privilege of baptizing 17, and then from there went to a city church and went to the high school, and many scores of the young people were gloriously saved by the blood of the Lamb. It wasn't about me. It was about the people who had been fasting and praying, crying out to God for a mighty move of heaven. So let's talk about this uh, revival. John writes to Christians, he says, if, this is conditional, we don't have to, but if, believers, we confess, homologamon, say the same thing as, admit, confess our sins, notice plural. This isn't in order to be saved. This is once you've been saved, and this is not talking about sonship. This is talking about fellowship with the Lord. And that's revival, returning to our first love. Revival is the outpouring of the Spirit of God upon men and women, Christians, who are hungry and thirsty for Him, breaking free from sin and idols and anything and everything that would grieve or quench the Holy Spirit. Are you willing to do that? Let's talk about revival. Thank you for joining us, by the way, and grab a pencil and pen and pray for us as we're praying for you. Revival a refreshing. Are you needing to be refreshed? Are you needing to be renewed? Probably most of us are. And whether the nation of America experiences revival, I'll talk about that in a moment, but you and I can be revived from a personal viewpoint. We'll explain more. So John says if we confess our sins, he, Christ Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, send them away, and cleanse us. That word cleanse is the word katharizai, which means wipe the slate clean. He didn't rub it in. Thank God Jesus rubs it out. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We're pronounced righteous and justified the moment of, of conversion, um, but it doesn't mean we're always in a right relationship with the Lord. And although we are positionally in Christ, conditionally we might not be walking with the Lord. So, Revival is meant for believers. Now, I see several revivals in the Old Testament, days of Hezekiah, Josiah, and Solomon wrote to Israel, I might add, Second Chronicles 7, 14, you know that, if my people, and there's the basis of revival, my people who are called by my name 
shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven. Forgive their sin, heal the land. There's the basis of revival. If my people, not lost people, my people, Israel, the ones that God had called, shall turn. And there's New Testament principles, by the way. I know technically speaking that's to Israel, but James says draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, your sinners. Purify your hearts, your double-minded. Be afflicted in mourning and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning. You're joined to heaven. Let's humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. He shall lift you up. That's James chapter 4. Uh, verse 6 says, submit to God, resist the devil. He'll flee from you. God gives grace, but he gives grace to the humble. And then, so the base of the revival, the burden of revival, con pray and seek my face, and then the blessing of revival. I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin. Now, I may not agree with some of you that are watching, and tell me what your comments are. There are some that are teaching, we call it dominionism theology, there's going to be a great spiritual awakening prior to Jesus Christ coming in the rapture. Now, I know there'll be a time of salvation for the Jews during the tribulation, but I adhere to the pre-tribulation rapture based on the wrath of God and other reasons for that, the bridegroom coming for the bride, and you can see our videos on that, but at any rate, uh, I don't see a great revival happening prior to the Lord coming. In fact, Paul said to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, know this, that in the last days perilous times shall come, but men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affections, truce breakers, incontinent, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness. And religion's not the problem. Relationship with the Lord Jesus is having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away the truth. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. So it seems like the days are getting darker and darker, demonic activity and an unleashing of the hordes of uh, the abyss, or if I can use that term, evil spirits. So let's talk three questions I want to ask you in our study. Number one, when do we need a revival? Number two, why do we need a revival? And number three, what's going to keep you from your revival? Let's talk about this. Number one, when do we need a revival? In the days of Habakkuk, going to the Old Testament, Habakkuk lived at a time when it was a national crisis, much like our day today. And Habakkuk, the prophet of old, couldn't understand why God would allow the Babylonians, a heathen nation, to come and to chastise his own people, namely to take them into captivity. You recall the event, 605 B.C., and so he needed a word from the Lord. And the Lord said, write the vision, make it plain that they that read it may run with it, and though, they t though it tarry, it will surely come to pass. But God said this through Habakkuk chapter 3. He said, O Lord, I've heard thy speech. This is verse 2. And I was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. This is just an isolated passage. You could turn to Psalm 85, verse 6. Revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee. And Psalm 138, verse 7, I believe it is, in the midst of trouble thou shalt revive me. Revival or survival? And I see no alternative than being revived. And revival again is uh, for the people of God. And so the Lord, when is a, re a revival needed? When it seemed like the Darkness is overtaking the light. Now, it's not, and the Lord is on his throne. He's in control. He's allowing things to happen. But I don't believe, as if you will be honest, and where you're at, that we've seen as much evil. I know that man's heart was on wickedness even the days of Noah, but we are seeing more and more blatant wickedness and immorality and idolatry uh, pervading our land in, in this we're ripen for a time of revival. And if you and I don't stay revived personally, then we'll go the way of the world. So uh, I believe revival is a restraining of the work of evil. The Lord restrains. He hears his people's cry. It's his will. And revival is not a thing or an it. It's Jesus. And it's his mighty manifestation of his glory. Now, the reason revival is needed, when a revival is needed, is we're heading to the Antichrist, the beast. This is not a hideous creature. Therion is the word, means the man of sin. He's a military man, an economical man. He is a political ruler, 
as described in Revelation 13, as in chapter 13, verse 4, chapter 13, verse 12, chapter 13, verse 16 through 18, as well as Daniel chapter 7, the Antichrist, and then this false religion. And this is the reason that revival is not an option. The false religion, man wants to be religious, always want to be religious, from Cain to Nimrod all the way up to the church of Pergamos, the seat of Satan. And we can see the Ashtoreths and the Baals in the Old Testament and the worship of idolatry, even in the New Testament. The reason when a revival is needed is when we're seeing false religions, false teaching, false preaching. I just spent time on the phone with one of our men for an hour. We were talking about uh, some of the extra books so-called of the Bible, the Apocrypha. And, the, and, and we said, you, I told him, I said, be honest with you, brother, be careful because it can create some confusion. All scriptures give the inspiration of God, the 66 books of the Bible. Nothing wrong with, you know, some Christian entertainment and maybe even books and so, so forth, but you got to be careful not to integrate fiction with truth, and otherwise you can open your mind up to some confusion. So why do we need a revival? And you recall what the Lord Jesus said to the church of Ephesus. He said, I know your works, but you've left your first love and therefore repent from where you've fallen. Pipto is the word fallen. You've, you've drifted. You've abandoned your first love. That's what the reason why we need a revival. Maybe I'm preaching to somebody right now or speaking to somebody right now. It's so easy to leave your first love. Jesus loved us first. He died and rose again. He gave his life's blood. And God loves us, and the Lord's not willing that any should perish. He, he invests a lot in us. Why we need a revival? Because other things occupy our time, our thoughts, our priorities get out of whack, and we put things other before Jesus, our, our love relationship, our time in the Word and prayer. And this isn't legalism. This is established and cultivating a relationship with Him. Tell me, are you right with the Lord? Maybe in just a moment when we pray at the end, I'm going to pray for your personal revival and mine as well. I love what Bertha Smith, the great missionary to China, once said, she said, get your sin list and go over it. It's not a bad idea. I had the privilege of preaching at a church uh, over in uh, Florida, and I'm just sharing this for the glory of the Lord. It was reminded, I was reminded as I was kind of preparing for this after I got off the phone, a man by the name of Dennis Simpson. He's the pastor over at Calvary Baptist Church, Palakuk, Florida. And he told me this. I'm just telling what he told me. He invited me to come to preach revival services. Revival's for the saints, but as a result, the lost will get saved. Now, I know in some revival meetings, there'll be people who are saved and the harvest is ripe. We've seen that to God be the glory. But he told me this. He said, Brother Pastor, we've not baptized anybody in years and years and years. And then he said, but the revival we had, he had a burden for revival. He was praying for revival. He was a spirit-filled man of God. And he just invited me to be a part of what God was doing. But after that revival that we were in for five years in a row, he told me later, he said, uh, we were able to, after the people got right with the Lord in the church from bad attitudes and self-righteousness and from hypocrisy and from uh, sense of omission, commission, those things we neglect to do and those things we don't do, not loving each other, praying for each other, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When the people of God saw Jesus and returned to their first love, then the result was, he said, we've had the privilege of baptizing 54 people in just the last few years when we had not baptized any. So that's the result of a real spiritual awakening and a reviving of the people of God, coming back to life. And so we all need that. We get uh, lethargic, we get apathetic, we get complacent, and things can just dull our spirits in the world and, and circumstances. But here the Lord spoke to these churches as we had the privilege of being then with them. He said, uh, return from your first love or else I'll remove the candlestick. And there's churches that need revival. Now, certainly our nation needs revival. But whether the nation experiences revival or not, or, or even the church you're in, you can be a spirit-filled man or woman of God and experiencing personal revival. And we'll talk more about that, how, in just a moment. So when do we need a revival? When it seems a dark day, the darker the 
night, the bright of the light, as it's been said. And then, why do we need a revival? We need a revival to get substance and spiritual strength and to fortify us with faith and to do great exploits, sharing the gospel. That's the result of revival. The church of Ephesus uh, burned their curious hearts. I never forget, after the Lord saved me, I was, had some things in my house, and God dealt with me to get rid of it and to follow him. Not a legalistic thing, but a love for the Lord. Maybe there's some things God's dealing with you about. I'm sorry, but I've got to say it. Sometimes if it doesn't bring glory to God, we ought to get rid of it. I don't care what it is. Music, dress, or shows, television, whatever. And that's not legalism. It's being sensitive to the still small voice of the Holy Spirit and being led by the Spirit of God. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Ephesians 4, 30 says the word grieve is lupio, which means to offend or hurt. And maybe today and right now as we're listening to this, like I need somebody to share with me the truth of God to lead me into a, a, a right relationship with the Lord. I don't want to play church. I don't want to occupy space. Do you? I don't think you'd be listening to this video if you did. So what, 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 how, can we, uh, how can we determine and find this revival? Evan Roberts was an instrument in the Great Welch Revival, and he noted four things particularly. And I might add, if you look at history, you find out the first Great Awakening in the 1700s were led by men like Jonathan Edwards, who preached the message, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Revival fires burned throughout the early known America, 1700, First Great Awakening. Secondly, the Second Great Awakening in the 1800s, George Whitfield and John Wesley and others preached the Word of God, and people were praying and fasting. 1851, I think it was, or 18, somewhere in there, 1850, the, the Fulton Street prayer meeting started. Never been a great revival without great praying. Uh, there's been revivals without uh, some of the other things, but it starts with God's people really, really getting right with the Lord. Somebody said we can't pray down a revival. It's the work of God. I believe we can pray, and if we'll do business with God, certainly we can experience a, a closer walk with the Lord and a joy because we lose our joy and our influence, our testimony, et cetera, our family, our legacy, et cetera. Confess every known sin. Number two, break free from every doubtful habit. Number three, obey the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Obey the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Number four, go public with your witness for Jesus Christ. And as I said, the Hebrides revival, and there's been numerous revivals that have uh, uh, taken place where swept across nations. And thank God I say do it again, Lord. But I, I must admit that I, in the light of the Bible prophecy, I wonder if the stage is being set for Jesus Christ to come again. And then, and only then, we're going to see the Lord in his glory. But meanwhile, we can continue to be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain of the Lord. So when do we need a revival? Why do we need a revival? And then last, what's going to take? What is it going to take? What's going to keep you from your revival? You know, you can doubt and do without, or you can believe and receive. Look what Leonard Ravenhill said. He was a proponent of revival. I like what he said. As long as we are content to live without revival, we will. He's right. And so many people today are content with going through the motions, maybe. Just the casual Christian life, or not saying they're not going to heaven. But in order to experience revival, there's got to be a agitation of uh, the wickedness going on in our land and, and our own personal sin and seeing Jesus for who he is. Will you join me right now that some of you have gotten weary in well-doing, some of you uh, perhaps have taken your eyes off the Lord. The scripture says we're to look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And so we can take our eyes off the Lord, we can get our priorities out of, out of whack, and the Lord said to that crowd in what we call the Sermon on the Mount, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you, food and raiment and clothes and the provisions the Lord gives. Certainly that's a message to even us today, the church, that is not worrying and being anxious. Maybe that's an issue you're having is anxiety and panic attacks and all this stuff the enemy's putting on us. And I want to pray for you. Many of you uh, comment, and I appreciate those comments, 
Many of you dear ladies like Rosa and the uh, other ones uh, across the waters, uh, I read them, every one of them, and they're a blessing to me. And I want to tell you, Ed and uh, others who, uh, Carol uh, over there in the Caribbean, and I'm trying to think of others who, that are just uh, such an encouragement to me personally. Many of my pastor friends and, and other uh, deacon friends and evangelist friends, missionary friends, uh, and, and just uh, leaders, servant leaders in the church. Revival is not an option. If you're going to, and I'm going to have an influence for the glory of the Lord in these days, we've got to stay close and clean. We've got to mm, confess our sins before the Lord. And, and return to our first love. So let's do that right now. And I want to pray with you. You pray for me. I want to pray for you. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Now, Jesus, you are the way, the truth, the life. And we, uh, Lord, we don't want to get the cart before the horse, but we want to say, I know you're more concerned about where I'm at and my relationship with you. And I confess, Lord, I'm not where I want to be. I'm not maybe where you want me to be. I believe that, Jesus. And I'm asking now for not only me, but many, many that are listening now that uh, you would search me, you'd cleanse me with the washing of water of the word, the blood of the Lamb of God, precious Jesus. I confess all known sin and unknown sin. And I just, uh, Lord, you know my heart is deceitful above all things, desperate and wicked. But God, I want to experience your resurrection power. I want you to refresh my heart and many, Father, that are listening now that have gotten discouraged and who are depressed. Many, Father, that are needing a breakthrough. They're needing, uh, Lord, you to send the wind. And we want to lift up the sails as the wind blows and cooperate with you. So give us spiritual sensitivity. Uh, sensitivity, Lord. And I pray, Father, that, uh, Lord, we'd not just seek an experience or an event, but we'd seek you to know you, to know the power of your resurrection, the fellowship of your suffering, realizing that we'll stand before you. And the spiritual gifts, as your servant Paul said, stir up the gift which is in thee to Timothy with a laying of hands. So I pray you'll stir up those gifts in us that we would... Uh, Stand and having done all to stand in these days, loving you, serving you, and watching you change hearts and send the fires and the power from heaven to churches and believers and pastors and Christians and mamas and daddies. And we'll give you praise and glory because you're worthy of it. We'll look forward to seeing you around your throne, but until then, we love you because of your love for us. Save the lost now, we pray, and revive your church, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. What a blessing to pray with you, and what a blessing for you to pray as well. God bless you, and God be with you till we meet again.